So before we get to news, Erin has had the baby. Juniper Josephine was born last weekend. She's seven pounds, one ounce. She was 19.75 inches. Erin's home. She's recovering. The baby's adorable. And that's all we could ask for. I'm so excited to again be joined this week by Crooked Media's Senior Political Director, Shaniqua. Shaniqua, how are you? I am wonderful. I'm actually in Atlanta today, so different different weather from L.A. Different weather from L.A., but same news. Same yes, news. Yes, same news. I just get it quicker. Okay, so let's get to it. Last Friday, Congress passed a historic $1.25 trillion infrastructure spending bill that will boost funding for transportation, internet access, clean drinking water, much of which will be distributed to states, which will then allocate the funds to regional projects. Shaniqua, before we get into the breakdown of this, can you walk us through how the politics of getting this historic bill passed and what it means that Build Back Better wasn't passed alongside it? Yeah, um, well, it's it's been a journey. And fun fact about me, I actually worked on infrastructure policy when I was on the Hill. And it was, yeah, always, always a lot of fun. Issue um, expert, it's finally infrastructure week for you. I know, I know. I've been waiting my entire life for this. So I'm really excited. Yeah, I mean, it's just been a journey. They um, So the bipartisan infrastructure bill that was passed on Friday out of the House was actually passed in August by the Senate. So three months ago, they passed this bill. But the reason that it hadn't passed the House is because progressives for once had a little bit of leverage. They had the Build Back Better plan, which is a social spending bill that is kind of um, the complement to this bipartisan infrastructure bill. Um, and it has a lot of things like it extends the child tax credit, which has helped cut child poverty in, in half since it's been implemented in one of the previous COVID bills. Um, there's possibly, hopefully going to be some paid family leave in there and just a lot of policies that will help um, people just kind of live. Uh, and so progressives pretty much said, hey, we're not going to pass this bipartisan bill unless we make sure the social spending bill gets passed. No Republicans are going to support that bill. So they needed every Democrat to do that. And over the past three months, we have seen, uh, of course, Joe Manchin and Kirsten Sinema say that they don't like all these things in the bill. But you also had a handful of moderates who, you know, I'll just call them centrist with no real ideology. They just didn't want to pass the bill. They always had a reason why they couldn't pass the bill. And so progressives said, we're not going to pass this bipartisan bill unless we know this other bill is going to pass. And, um, you know, for whatever reason that we will have faith uh, in their decision on Friday, they decided that they no longer needed to hold on to the bipartisan package and pass the bill. Some people think it's because of the results out of Virginia that they felt like we just need to get something done. But Representative Diapol, who leads the Progressive Caucus, has said that she trusts Joe Biden to, to get this over the finish line. I am going to put my trust in her uh, because I cannot put it in Kirsten Cinema and Joe Manchin. Uh, <laughs> but if everything goes well, um, this bill will be passed at some point soon. Um, uh, moderates or centrists in the House said that they, you know, they still want to see a CBO score, which could take some time. But they said next week that they'll vote on the bill um, as long as everything lines up. So hopefully they pass that and then it goes over to the Senate. And then we just have to put our faith in those folks over there to see what they come up with. And they'll probably make some changes to it, uh, send it back to the House, and then fingers crossed it gets passed. Or they could say we're not doing this anymore. But that's just me being a pessimist, and I should not be that way. Shaniqua, what are some of the big ticket items that are in this bill that we can all look forward to? Yes. So if you drive over potholes or feel a little uneasy on bridges, there's $110 billion in the bill for roads and bridges which is just really important for us to get around. Um, it's important for how goods move around the country. Uh, and, you know, potholes mess up cars. I don't drive that much, but when I, whenever I go to New York, I drive my father's car and he's always like, there's a pothole there. And so people care about those. So getting those <laughs> fixed. Uh, there's $65 billion for expanding broadband access. That's really important. You know, I grew up in a really rural part of North Carolina and yeah, we didn't have internet. <laughs> I had to go to school to use internet. And during COVID, there were a lot of students who couldn't get their work done because they didn't have access to broadband. So this will be really important so more Americans can access internet. Uh, $65 billion to upgrade our electric grid. Uh, that's important all over the country. You know, we saw what happened in Texas when the weather got really cold. And even in some states where, you know, like California where the weather and Texas, where the weather gets really hot, um, you know, that can impact the electric grid. 
$39 billion for public transit. Um, you know, sorry to keep injecting my personal stories, but when I started <laughs> working on transportation policy, I got really upset because I was like, this is not a social issue. I want to work on social issues. But when you start exploring a lot of these things and thinking about something like public transit, it's how people who don't have cars get around and whether or not we have enough money invested in that is, is a big deal. Um, and something else that's in the bill that, you know, has gotten a lot of attention in the last couple of days is $1 billion for reconnecting communities. And that might sound kind of like, what does that even mean? But in the past, infrastructure and infrastructure policy has been used to kind of separate communities and keep people of color and poor people separate from white people and more affluent people. And so now this $1 billion can be used to kind of um, reverse some of those um, racist and prejudiced policies that have been put in place in the past. And so now, Shaniqua, that's big picture. But to give people a sense of what that means for their communities, here's some here's some local flavor, okay? So in Arizona, this will improve broadband access for 14% of Arizonans who have none and 45% who live in an area with only one provider. In Colorado, this means $35 million to protect against wildfires. In Iowa, it means $638 million for water infrastructure. In Ohio, money will go to the Great Lakes Restoration Fund, which will get a billion dollars to fund projects to decrease pollution, address erosion, and invasive species. And in one of my favorites, in Alaska, the Alaska Marine Highway System, which encompasses the ferries that help connect the state, they're going to set money to construct a ferry system to reach the most rural of communities. And so, Shaniqua, when we are always pissed that the news is always trash, this is truly wonderful news. Yeah. It's been painted by the media as a failure or falling short by Joe Biden. This is historic. Every person in the country is going to benefit mm -hmm. from this. So, you know, normally – we might toast or roast today, but there was a little bit of bad news this week. And so, yeah. Shaniqua, I'm going to – we're going to bring back Fuck That Guy because we haven't done a Fuck That Guy segment in a while. Exciting. And I'm going to send it over to you to tell us what guy should – well, fuck off. Absolutely. Um, you know, there's always a long list of, of men we could put in this category, but today it's going to be Arizona Representative Paul Gosar. He, you know, he's someone who was sharing conspiracy theories about January 6th, big Trump guy. But this week he posted um, on Twitter an anime, an altered anime video that basically depicts him killing Representative Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and, and injuring the president um, with, with swords. And something I remember during my internship at the White House is if someone wrote a threatening letter to the president, Secret Service showed up at your door. So I don't understand how this is any different and no one is showing up, um, you know, at his door. They know where he works. They could get there pretty quickly. Um, and, you know, just thinking about Representative Ocasio-Cortez, she gets a lot of just kind of vitriol from, from a lot of people and should not have to get that from her actual colleagues, whether or not they're in the same party, whether or not they believe the same thing. She shouldn't have to experience that. And, you know, she responded to the video and probably is very right in saying that there won't be any consequences for him because the person who runs his caucus, um, Kevin McCarthy, he kind of cheers these things on and then they fundraise off of these things. And something that I thought was really interesting is that his digital director, who I guarantee is the actual person who like put this video together and, and put it out into the world. One, she's a woman. Her name is Jessica Lycos. And she basically said, everyone needs to relax. And so, you know, unfortunately, we're going to have to add a woman in here and say, fuck her, too. And then I tried to go see who his comms director was because they would have had to prove this. And actually, if you go to his website right now, he has a page with his staff. Jessica's not on there and neither is a comms director. So I don't know if they pulled them huh. off to kind of uh, help them avoid any kind of accountability. Um, but yeah, you know, it's an unfortunate situation. And Twitter has basically said that a public interest notice has been placed on his account. I don't know what that means. You know, he should be off of the platform if he's uh, putting threatening and violent uh, stuff out like that. But if Twitter won't do anything uh, more than that or Kevin McCarthy, we can at least say... Fuck that guy. Fuck that guy. Please welcome 
award-winning actress, activist, and my fave almost governor, Cynthia Nixon. Hey, Alyssa, how are you? So, Cynthia, thank you so much for joining us today because we know that you're just like a little busy right now (laughs) with many things, but especially bringing our beloved Miranda Hobbs back to life. Are you having the best time? I am literally having the time of my life. I I have to say I was I was reluctant. I was scared. I said, but it has to be this if we come back, but it has to be this, but it has to be this. And then all of these things materialized. And, you know, uh, some months back, I can't even remember, I guess it was June, we all gathered together and did the the read through of the first three episodes. And I really I thought I had died and gone to heaven. It was like the writing is so amazing. You know, these actors, we've known each other for forever and we have these amazing new playmates who are deigned to join us. And I don't know. It's like it was electric. It was really one of the 10 best days of my life. Oh, my God. Well, we're going to get to that a little bit more later. (laughs) But why I really wanted to have you on, Cynthia, is because, you know, we spend a lot of time talking about why people were wrong about things, but we like rarely let people come and gloat a little bit about when they were right. And so a few weeks ago, for those who don't know, Albany County Sheriff charged Governor Cuomo with forcible touching. And now, Cynthia, you won't believe it. Cuomo is asking for an investigation into the sheriff. Of course he is. (laughs) So the revelations of the last year about Cuomo could be categorized as horrifying, but not actually surprising to anyone who knows New York state politics. And during your campaign, you called him out for cronyism, abuses of power, evading accountability. You saw Cuomo then as many have finally come to see him now. So you knew then it would be an all-hands mission from Team Cuomo to take you down. So what what really pushed you into the race, knowing how brutal it would be? You know, the thing that really pushed me into the race was uh, education funding. Um, because I've been an activist most of my life, but the, when my activism really kicked into high gear was the year that my oldest child um, entered kindergarten in 2001 and there were these massive budget cuts and I got involved in fighting for education funding on a city level but very quickly I saw that the state really controlled the money and that we had actually four billion dollars that was owed us because of a lawsuit I won't go into all the details but the thing that was preventing that money actually from being distributed was Andrew Cuomo um, and People had actually been, because of CFE, because of the Campaign for Fiscal Equity, which would fully fund New York State schools um, and redo the funding formula so that they're, that our most starved, under-resourced schools would get their fair share. They had been trying to get me to run since 2010, and I had always been like, you've got to be crazy. And then uh, Zephyr Teachout ran in 2014 when I also passed. And she did such an amazing job. I, I couldn't believe what I was watching in terms of her shining a light on him and the kind of person he was and the incredible corruption. And also, I think most importantly, all the legislation that we could have passed, progressive legislation that would have greatly improved the lives of New Yorkers. And he, he wouldn't. Um, because he, you know, at, at root, he is, you know, he's a Democrat because he's Mario Cuomo's son and because he is in New York State, but he is really a Republican at heart and he really doesn't want to fund things. He just wants to not tax people and control his own power. So when I saw what Zephyr did and she got, I think, you know, and nobody would pay any attention to her. They wouldn't put her on television. They wouldn't interview her. They wouldn't take her seriously. He wouldn't debate her. They dragged her into court. They tried to, they terrorized her and they wouldn't take her seriously. And she got, I believe, 35% of the vote. Right. And I was like, if Zephyr Teachout, who no one will put on TV, um, can do that, what am I being so chicken about? Because I can get on TV. I, I know that I can. And I know, and I know, um, You know, I've been an activist in New York politics for, you know, at least 10 years, depending on what you count. And I was, you know, my wife and I really fought hard to get marriage equality passed. I have some experience in Albany. And but at root, I know it's a two to one Democratic state. It's an incredibly progressive place. 
And because there's a Democrat in the governor's mansion, we're all like, oh, he's a Democrat. He's blue. He's taking care of things. I don't need to worry. And really, the complete opposite was true. And I and so I ran to shine a light on it. And I really essentially also ran because nobody else would. Because the thing about Andrew Cuomo is he is amazingly ruthless and vindictive. And if you are even tangentially involved in politics and you go up against him, much less run against him, he will destroy your livelihood, like he tried to do to Ron Kim recently. Um, and so there were many people who would have liked to run, but they could, their careers would be over. Whereas, knock on wood, I'm in the arts and there's really not a lot he can do to me. And that enabled me to run. So I remember watching your debate. And you were a fucking ninja. You were a ninja, Cynthia. And the funny thing is, the press didn't really cover it that way. You said that the, the press didn't even cover Zephyr. How did the press cover you? The press covered me like I was this wacko, ditzy um, actress. And, and, and actress, not actor, right? But actress, actress. and all that implies a lot of Cosmo jokes that were coming yeah. from the Cuomo camp um, that they were spoon feeding the media. And I have to say, you know, some of, some of the media and particularly there, there, there were journalists who took us seriously and, and female journalists in particular, but a few men too. But there was this general sense of, isn't she sweet and misguided? Isn't she cute? If I put her on, you know, if I interview her, people will watch it. But sure, certainly we don't want this woman, you know, to, to, to be taken seriously as a candidate. And Andrew Cuomo is is governor of New York. You know, the sun comes up in the morning and Andrew Cuomo is governor of New York. That's just the way it's been, you know, for a long time. And it's it's just stretching, you know, into the future. One of the funniest quotes that I read, and I didn't know if it was supposed to be a compliment or a criticism, but it made me think you were like the baddest bitch ever. In, in the New York Times in the summer of 18, a reporter wrote, surely Nixon, the only candidate in history who said she had no trouble performing nude on television because she had already breastfed on the number two train. I think that made you sound <laughs> New York-y as fuck. <laughs> Thank you. I was Thank like, you. okay, she can be my governor. But so here's a question. <laughs> So you ran, you worked your fucking ass off, and now here we are, someone, Cuomo's not governor anymore. But that aside, based on your campaign, how many of the issues that you campaigned on in the primary are becoming a reality now here in New York? The lion's share of them, I mean, which is amazing. So for me, certainly... The, um, the campaign for fiscal equity, the fully funding of our of our schools um, that we have, you know, this is a lawsuit that was brought in 93 and was being settled by Governor Spitzer when he, uh, you know, left office in disgrace. So for me, that's, you know, that's front and center. But there were, you know, there were so many things. There was criminal, you know, criminal justice reform. Um, there was the passing of the New York Green Green Deal. There was the um, bringing our abortion laws into into line with the federal standard. Um, there was the Dream Act. There was the passage of Genda. I mean, the the it, it, it's it's really amazing. The list goes on and on and on. Legal weed. Legal weed. The, the you know the most progressive. Um, housing laws in the country, you know, uh, uh, rent laws. Um, yeah, I mean, that's the thing is we were able to, when I was deciding whether to run, you know, I went to the people, the grassroots people in all of these areas. And I said, if you were governor, if you could write the governor's platform, if you could write, what would you do? And we incorporated all of it. And then I think the really important thing about 2018 was I was running, yes, and, and Jamani Williams was running for, for lieutenant governor, um, uh, and Zephyr, was, Zephyr Teachout was running for AG, but really maybe the most significant thing was there was this group called the IDC, which were these eight Democratic state senators elected as Democrats who had been turned by the Republican leadership and also 
frankly, by the governor, although he never admits it, um, and incentivized to caucus with the Republicans and give the Republicans control of the state Senate so that all of this stuff was 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 jammed, was was unable to pass and in some cases unable to even be brought up for a vote. Eight people who were all women and or people of color ran against these eight IDC and six of them got in. And so the entire makeup of the New York State Senate changed so that now the Democrats were in in the leadership and Andrea Stewart Cousins was then the, the you know, the, the top dog there. And right. and so all this legislation then started to pass. And then the governor, you know, either he had to veto it and show his true colors or he had to sign off on it. And then very shortly after that, I guess the, um, the next year or I guess two years, we then got a veto proof majority, which was amazing. So it's like, go ahead, veto it. We will just we will just override you. So I think it was really important, our campaign to show all of the things that we could have in this two to one democratic state um, if if we only tried, but then also the governor didn't have a, Repu- have a Republican led Senate to hide behind him. Well, and it's so interesting too, because had you not been challenging him, his fire would have been trained on them. Right. But you were kind of the one taking all the incoming. So they were actually able to have campaigns that could get traction without the Cuomo folks being too, too involved. Yeah. I just also want to say, I feel like an exciting thing that's happening in the progressive movement is we are starting to run as teams, you know, that we're starting to run in tandem with each other, whether it's the Working Families Party slate or the Democratic Socialists of America slate. And, you know, so many progressive people have just been elected to the New York City Council and they kind of, you know, Tiffany Caban is an amazing person who who was almost elected Queens uh, DA. Um, You know, she came in with such wind at her back. And so she knew that she was a shoe in, but she took some of her sparkle and her firepower and she really, you know, made a coalition. And I think that this and and certainly that's what the anti-IDC candidates did, is that when progressives, when progressives who are really talking about these meat and potatoes issues that move the ball forward, don't just run singly, but say, you like me, I'm like that one and like that one and like that one. And we're a team and vote for us and support us and donate to us. And like the lesson here too, is that you can have a huge impact even if you don't win. That is so much in a way about what your candidacy is about. You move the needle in New York State, even though you didn't win. And we have so many policies now as someone who lives in upstate New York that I see daily because of your run. And so, so grateful to you, Cynthia Nixon. And, you know, I was one of your people, po- political people are tough, but I was one of your biggest supporters during the campaign. I couldn't yes, get enough. Yes, they were. I even I even wrote an op-ed for the Upstate New York Papers, and in it I was like, I know I could face retribution for this, hoping that then they couldn't do anything. My husband was like, they're going to raise our taxes because of your damn op-ed. And I was like, <laughs> we had – anyway, so I just want to say thank you for running and thank you for being an example to people that even if it's an uphill battle, it doesn't mean that you still can't make change even if you don't win. I mean, that's the thing about – why it's so important to challenge incumbents, you know, from within our own party, you know, because we got it, we got it, we got to drag people left. We got to drag people left and we can do it by talking about the issues because when we talk about our issues, the people, you know, the voters are like, wow, that would be great. Universal health care, we could right. have that legalized marijuana, we could have that really actually muscular rent laws, you know, and an end to cash bail so that people aren't sitting in jail for 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 months and sometimes horribly years on end awaiting trial that aren't that are legally innocent in the in the in the court's eyes, but are just sitting in jail because they they can't afford a few hundred dollars or a few thousand dollars. And it's so important to talk about too, because so much of what the GOP likes to paint as fucking wacky socialism are actually 
policies that other industrial, like 90% of other industrialized countries have had for years. We're not leading the world here. We're trying to catch the fuck up in a lot of instances. I have to say, I was, I was so thrilled by India Walton's candidacy as mayor of Buffalo recently. And so deeply, deeply sad that she did not, she did not prevail. But I think that if you just look at that one case, I mean, it's so it's so like Cuomo, right, that Byron Mm -hmm. Brown, who's Democratic mayor, he's been the Democratic mayor there for 16 years. He's barely a Democrat like Cuomo. He's really just interested in, in holding on to power and paying off his his cronies and distributing the money to those who support him and and starving the city of of any resource otherwise. If you look at what happened when India Walton, who ran an amazing grassroots campaign with not a single paid staffer, and she took from him the Democratic nomination. She was the Democratic nominee. But what happened is, you know, a lot of people that I consider in the establishment, like, you know, even like Chuck Schumer and, you know, Kristen Gillibrand, I mean, they endorsed her. But, you know, Jay Jacobs, the head of the New York State Democratic Party, did not. Kathy Hochul, our Democratic you know, governor who is from Buffalo herself did not endorse. And what you saw was they vilified her and they made her a a boogie woman and Republican money poured into Byron Brown's coffers. And that's what happens so much, even with people who are ostensibly in our party, when they get challenged from the left, they just team up with the Republicans and just, you know, do everything they can to beat us up and, and, and vilify us. And it's, it's, it's really, you know, we have different wings of the democratic party, but I wish we had more, um, more sense of like, don't team up with those guys. Just they don't like have fundamental, your, they, fundamental don't threshold. Team up with those guys, they, they stand for really the opposite of, of everything that we're saying we stand for. And if you're if you're not going to support the Democratic nominee, don't ever come back to me and say, you know, oh, hold your nose and vote for me because I'm a Democrat. It was like, where were you for India Walton? She was the nominee totally. and you and you, you know, you totally. beat the you beat the Republican money bushes for uh, for the bad guy. So politics can be both depressing and inspiring. But you know, what's just nothing but good. And just like that. (laughs) Okay. From your lips to God's ears. Thank you. Oh, I'm so ready for it. Are you kidding? Just so you know, in 2008, this is one of my favorite stories. In 2008, we're on the Obama campaign when Sex and the City, the movie comes out. And we had not done anything for ourselves. It's really before people ever talked about self-care. And every single one of my ladies that worked for me, we were like, God is our witness. Nothing is stopping us. And we went to the Chinese restaurant across the way. We all had some Cosmos. And then we went and saw Sex and the City together. And it was literally one of our greatest memories of the campaign because it was such fucking joy. And so I know that that same group of women, we've all been texting. We're like, when does it come out? Do I have HBO Max? And so a couple questions. Yes. One. So one of the things that I was, I guess, I don't know. Well, I'll ask you your opinion. I'll save my opinion. So I read Sarah Jessica in Vogue that Naomi Fry did, and she calls out the misogynistic and ageist comments in response to the new season, which ranged from, oh my God, they have gray hair, to some very pathetic Golden Girls jokes, to like, they have no wrinkles. They have too many wrinkles. Did you think that people were going to come, that that was going to be the criticism of the show? Yes, I, 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 I have to say I'm not. I'm not at all surprised. It's not, it's not where my mind goes, but, um, but yeah, totally. I mean, I think, you know, we're in our, we're in our mid fifties, right. And men who, I mean, I don't know what men are in their mid fifties. I mean, Clooney's older, George Clooney's older than that. Right. Totally. Right. I mean, Brad Pitt, he's probably older than that. It's like, there there is right. There is a, a level on which, you know, men with their graying temples and their wrinkle, you know, can be like, you know, the hunkiest they've ever been. And it's like, it's like, yeah, some of the, I won't, I won't typify the kind of things that they're saying, or I, I hear that they're saying, but yeah, there's an unbelievable double standard. And, you know, I, I mean, I have to say when the show, so first, first, first come out when we were little, little children in our early thirties or whatever. Um, 
there was a lot of, of revulsion that the press tried to hit us with at that time. It was just a different tone. It was like, this is disgusting. The women talking about sex like this, and these aren't really women. These are gay men disguised as women and, and all this stuff. It, you know, the, 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 the actual frank sexual appetite of the characters was really, you know, freaked some, some people in the press out, but not seemingly the viewers. Um, so I, you know, I hope that there will be a, a, a similar um, dichotomy this time. We'll see. Uh, and I just do feel like, you know, I, I love these women. I love these, these, you know, the people who have been in the show, you know, for a long time, but also we have these incredible, incredible new performers, you know, Nicole Ari Parker and Karen Pittman and Sarita Cowdery and Sara Ramirez, just to mention, like, there's actually many more than that, but like, those are the, the big new four. Um, and these women are incredible and gorgeous and so different from us and so different from each other. And I don't know, it's, it's, there really aren't a lot of shows, I think, about women in their 50s. There are barely shows about women in their 40s. Um, and it, it, and I, I feel like, you know, when I was not yet this age, I'm 55, I viewed this this period of life as just like Nebraska. It's just like just flat. It's all the same, <laughs> right. and it just stretches out. And it's like you're just in that. You know, you're not old, old, but you're certainly not young. But there's there are so once what but once you get into a particular place, of course, there's all this specificity and 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 differentiation between being fifty and being fifty five. You know, between being forty five and fifty, and it's like. Let's look at it and let's look at it with characters that we already know and love. And I don't know, I'm I'm I am thrilled to be to be this age and to to get to, you know, not only return to this character, but let her be the age that she is. And and having all of these, you know, postmenopausal uh, experiences, um, because I, I have to say, you know, as a as a woman, in, as an actress, as a woman in show business, you know, there's like. You're, first I was a kid because I was a kid actor, you're a kid, then you're the girl, then you're like the love interest, and then you're the mom, and then you're the mom forever. The mom period, like in life, goes on for a really long time. And then you get to the age where your kids are grown, your fictional kids in this case, or, you know, and all of a sudden the parts get more interesting because I think we have this anxiety about women who are of the age to be taking care of vulnerable children and being too interesting and to, you know, I don't know, having, having the, the ugly parts of them or the less attractive, you know what I mean? That, that unless you turn into an outright villain, but once you get kind of past that, there's an enormous amount of, of exploration and like different colors inside you that you're allowed to show. And I think that's true in life. And I think, I certainly that's been true in my experience in terms of the parts that I've been offered. Is there any, if if we speak very <laughs> quietly, if we speak very quietly, is there anything that you can tell us about what we're going to see from Miranda? I don't think so. I don't think I can tell you anything, although I have to say, you know, Brady was always a big part of Miranda's life and he is now being played by this amazing actor, Neil Cunningham and David Eigenberg, who plays Steve. And I, I mean, we fell in love with him the moment we saw him. And it's so amazing for us to, you know, have been acting with these people playing our young children. And now right. they're, they're, they're teens and tweens and, um, and beyond. And, you know, that, that is, that is very exciting for me to see, to see Miranda with an with an almost almost out of the nest uh, offspring. This is our last question because I know you've got to run on to many many yes. other things today. Yes. So I saw on Instagram that you actually directed and starred in an episode of I and just did. like that. I Was did. that your first time directing? I've directed three three production full productions on stage, um, but I've never done anything on film before. And so it was one of the, one of the things that we talked about when we were signing up and I was so thrilled and terrified and all that stuff. And I have to say, I mean, they really, 
they they supported me so so much with all with the prep time and we had uh, it, it, in, they were incredibly supportive both certainly the actors were all very supportive but everybody on the crew and the whole production team um it was it was amazing and i just you know i handed in my my director's cut of it at the end of last week and i think they're they're going to be scoring it soon and it's almost done and i think it's i think it's Pretty good, pretty good episode. It's episode 106. So it's 106. Just okay. 106 okay. out of 10. Yeah, we're doing 10 episodes. So Cynthia Nixon, thank you so much for joining pleasure. us on Hysteria. It was such a pleasure. 